Hello YouTube, Matthew Slade here, otherwise known as Slade01. Uh, I don't normally make videos like this, but oh, I just felt like I had to. So here I go with my review of Iron Man 3. Iron Man 3. Let's start from the beginning. Um, when I first heard that Favreau, Favreau, I think, how you say it? When I first heard he was stepping down. Uh, I, of course, got a little concerned. We've seen uh, director changes affect movies very greatly. Harry Potter, when they uh, switched out uh, for part three, I mean, let's face it, anyone who's ever read the books knows that Azkaban is probably the worst one in the entire series. Uh, <laughs> X-Men 1 and 2, I mean, honestly, who really thought X-Men 3 fit with the rest of that trilogy? Maybe you did. I don't know. I personally did not. So I was a little um, worried, but I said, I'll reserve judgment. He's a different director. Let's see where he takes it. Uh, you know, the cast didn't change, so Robert Downey Jr. and um, everyone else, you know, all of them, Gwyneth Paltrow, they're all still there, and they could all still give input. Um, and then when I saw the first trailer and the second trailer and all the trailers, pretty much uh, I was... I. My hopes had risen. I thought, well, this looks like Iron Man, so it's going to be good. I got to say, Shane Black, you let me down, man. And from what I've read online, you've let a lot of people down. Uh, there's some reviews that, that, that say it was good, but, man, oh my god. Oh, where did it go wrong? Where did it go wrong? Where didn't it go wrong? All right, let's break this down. The very beginning of the movie, as soon as the movie began, the difference in director was apparent. Part one started out with back in black. Part two didn't take long for us to, you know, see Tony jumping out of a plane with a shoot thrill plane. So automatically I'm thinking, good God almighty, what is, um, what is this one going to start with? Are we going to hear shook me all night? Uh, you know, Hell's Bells, how in the hell that would have been appropriate for Belly of the Beast film. Um, but no, what we were instead treated to was the song Blue, uh, which I am not not a fan of. I like the song, but it was an Iron Man. It, it, it totally broke it for me. Right there, I was like, mm, oh well, you know, different director, I'll let it go. Who cares? It's just an opening song. Let's keep going. Now, it's safe to say that spoilers are going to be from this point on. If you haven't seen the film and you don't want it to be spoiled, stop this video now. If you don't care about spoilers or if you have seen the film, by all means, keep watching. So, <clears throat> what we are treated to is, and I'm going to break this whole film down, uh, what we're treated to is... Uh, uh, you see this party, and it's obviously some kind of science convention, and immediately my first thought is, oh, this must be where he gave the speech that Jensen in the first movie was uh, talking about. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was. Um, you see Jensen meet him, blah, blah, blah. Hey, Tony. Tony blows him off. Jensen realizes he's drunk, and I mean, you know, well, you know how his story plays out. Um, but then we're introduced to two other characters. Two characters that we've never seen before in any of the Marvel movies and we essentially don't give a shit about. Um, and I gotta be honest with you, after seeing how Tony blows them off, pretty much, I mean, the, the girl he has the one night stand with and then, you know, writes down some equation on the back of his name tag, leaves it, leaves in the morning. You know, she was just another piece of tail for him. Oh well, it was Party Boy Stark. That took place in 1999. Bam! Next thing you know, you got uh, this other guy, uh, Killian, Adrian Killian, and uh, which, by the way, in the comics was not a big character. Why Shane Black did what he did with him, I, I don't know. Don't know. We're, we're going to get to that later. Killian um, got an idea, needs Tony to help him out with it. Tony blows him off. It's Tony Stark. The man didn't have tits. So he's butthurt about that. All right, flash forward to the future. And uh, we have Tony Stark. Uh, uh, post Avengers, who is suffering from you know um, stress disorders, anxiety attacks, uh, which I mean is perfectly acceptable. I mean, let's face it: if you had to fight aliens and you found out there were gods, you saw the Hulk for the first time in real life, not just videos. 
Uh, you flew a nuclear bomb through an interdimensional portal and then died, fell to Earth, barely saved by the Hulk, got resuscitated. I mean, you know, you'd, you'd be pretty shook up too. I, I would hate to meet the man that wouldn't be shook up by such events. So that I was fine with, you know, seeing Tony spooked, whatever. That's great. That's expected. Um, and obviously in his time where he can't sleep, he's building all these armors. He's got these really cool armors. This is where the first flaw comes from. The first flaw comes from the fact that Tony built with minimal sleep and the pressure of getting killed, he built his first Iron Man armor in a cave out of a box of scraps, as Obadiah Stane put it. And it worked. It worked fine. He got him out of the cave and had he not crash landed it probably would have stayed intact long enough for him to be rescued in it he took that design and then just immediately you know revitalized it once he was in a, a lab and i mean it didn't take him long to get the technology down now he's got the technology and he's made an armor that survived he's made armors that survived all kinds of attacks the uh, thinnest armor he ever made the mark four or five whichever one it was the one that folded out from the suitcase it survived being whipped by whips that clearly could cut a car in half, and it survived that. Yeah, it scratched up a little bit, tore a little bit of the armor off, but the thinnest armor survived that attack. Here we are treated to an armor which consistently throughout the movie falls apart like a puzzle piece and doesn't work exactly like it should. You're telling me Tony Stark forgot how to build an Iron Man suit? Um, meanwhile, and I'll get to that later, but there, I'll get to it later in more detail, but you've got other armors that end up getting torn to pieces so easy. But Tony Stark has built armors that have held up to Whiplash. They held up to Ironmonger. Hell, his armor even held up to Thor in the Avengers. And you're telling me that these extremist people can just rip them apart. I'll get back to that later. Um... So anyway, obviously there's tension between him and Pepper. She's moved in, that much is obvious, blah, blah, blah. Later, Pepper's talking to this Adrian guy, and all of a sudden he's like all fixed and whatnot. You know, he's not on a cane anymore, he's not hunchback, he doesn't like a friggin' dork on steroids. You know, it, but then it's an obvious uh, tension between them. Not an overplayed plot point. I actually still was okay with the movie at this point. I honestly was. I was watching it like, okay, this is this is still decently Iron Man. Um, really, it stopped being Iron Man to me at the point of um, his manner being destroyed. I did not mind the rebranding of War Machine into Iron Patriot. It was a good use of the Iron Patriot armor, which of course is featured in the comics as being worn by Norman Osborn, but of course Norman Osborn is not going to be part of the Iron Man movie series, so that's fine. I didn't mind that. I was okay with that. But as soon as Tony started, you know, once he got into Tennessee and he finds this, uh, there's this garage and there's this kid there and the kid's obviously supposed to remind Tony of himself and it, that's just so overplayed and the kid, I didn't really think he was that great of a kid actor and you can't do, oh, he was a kid, he was a kid. You know what? Fuck y'all. Haley Joel Osment, all right? That's all I'm going to say. Um, anyway, so, um... What can I say? Um, I did not care for that story plot. And then all of a sudden, there's more extremist people. And these extremist people, I'm not really sure what they could do in the comics. Um, I'm not that not that into Iron Man's comics. But these guys, for some reason, have like lava bodies. I don't know. And then they could like blow up. I, I don't know. It just seemed like a little too much for me. Um, and meanwhile, you got Tony, who's like trying his damnedest to survive this fight between two of them, and he's got no armor. Um, a lot of people complain that he was fighting for this armor. Uh, you know, he was fighting to charge his armor. He was trying to survive without his armor, but he had, like, 40 armors in his basement. All right, I will address that complaint, because I don't have a complaint about that, because if you listened to the dialogue, that cellar was covered in rubble, and it wasn't until Jarvis reminded him that the uh, cleanup crews had removed the rubble that he knew that he could access those armors. They were they were in a safe zone that couldn't be accessed because of the rubble. So that complaint was put to rest. Also, while I'm putting complaints to rest, a lot of people like to say before the movie came out, and even some now still like to say, "Well, Chris Nolan did this first. We you know we got a broken hero who's fighting to you know the hell with that shit because this is." Chris Nolan did not do it first. 
all right? Batman was not the first movie to do a Belly of the Beast story. And if you don't know what Belly of the Beast story is, go Google it for crying out loud. You know, it's not that difficult. Uh, every hero at some point goes through the Belly of the Beast. Uh, Empire Strikes Back was Belly of the Beast. You know, um, yes, Dark Knight Rises was Belly of the Beast. Well, in that same sense, so was Iron Man 3. But I really didn't get that from this film as much. It didn't seem that impending. And honestly, you know, because we get to the point later where we find out that Adrian Killian... Um, is, you know, the main bad guy. He's trying to take down Stark. His extremist people are trying to take down Stark. Um, it's revealed that he's possibly, it's revealed he's working for the Mandarin. Um, but honestly, I'm thinking, okay, well, that's it. Then. That, that's why he's trying to kill Stark. He's working for the Mandarin. And the Mandarin, of course, has ten rings. What was the um, terrorist organization called in part one? Yensen clearly called them the Ten Rings. So I'm thinking, obviously, he's the leader of that group who's coming for well-established revenge. And that is the biggest disappointment in the whole damn film. This is the part that broke the film for me. All of its other flaws, I would forgive had it not been for this. Now, final warning, if you have not seen the movie and you don't want it spoiled, biggest spoiler of the entire film. I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think about it. Okay, all right, gave you enough time to stop this film. The twist, the Mandarin is not even the Mandarin. He's an actor named Trevor who's a drug addict, and they get him to play this guy named the Mandarin, which is the biggest slap in the face and middle finger that Shane Black could have ever given to any of the fans, and even people who've never read the comics. My wife has never read an Iron Man comic, and probably never will, and she knows nothing about the Mandarin, and yet she was pissed that he wasn't real. It was a facade. The real bad guy was Adrian. He's not working for the Mandarin. Technically, he is the Mandarin. I am the Mandarin. You know what? The hell with that shit. That was not only a mockery of the greatest villain in Iron Man's rogue gallery, it was a waste of the talents of Mr. Ben Kingsley. Total waste of his talents. So, it was a double waste and a double F you to fans watching the movie. Um... And this is where it starts to just get shitty. I mean, we got a broken down Stark. Okay, you know what? That's fine. He seems vulnerable. I get that. But then they start like really breaking his character. Case in point, there's a line in the movie where the kid's like, where this, the kid he's talking to says his dad, you know, walked out on him like six years ago. And Tony's like, oh yeah, well, you know, fathers leave. That happens. No need to be a pussy about it. And I'm like, you know, that's a little douchebag, a little too douchey, even for Tony Stark. I mean, come on, guy. You don't have to be a pussy about it. He's talking to a little kid. Anyway. I'm done with that uh, dialogue, but no, no, seriously, honestly, the Mandarin, not real. That totally pissed me off. I was, I was so mad because that could have been so such a great film, which th thus, like I said, makes Adrian Killian the main bad guy, which means his whole motive for wanting to kill Stark is because he was butthurt about being, about being, uh, you know, dissed by Stark. I mean, come on, I don't care about your little butthurtness. I really don't. You know. Compare that to the first two villains. Obadiah Stane was Tony Stark's father's friend, and then his friend, his confidant. And he sold Tony out so that he could have his throne. And then tried to kill him with his own technology. Very personal battle. Part two, you had Ivan Vanko. He was carrying over a battle left over by the fathers of both, who are then both dead. So... Very personal battle. All the meanwhile, Stark's trying to find a way to save himself from his own uh, poison in his chest. And that, that's a great movie with great character development and great personal battle. I felt that. I felt betrayed by Obadiah Stane. And I felt the, the, the anger of Ivan Vanko. I didn't give a shit about Adrian Killian's little... I mean, I didn't, I didn't care. I didn't care. Oh, Tony Stark just... Oh my God, get over yourself. All right, so continuing with the story, it had its highlights. It did. Um, I enjoyed the manor being destroyed. Very good action sequence. Um, I liked... There was a part where Air Force One's attacked, and Tony has... Y'all seen it in the commercials. Tony's got to uh, save all these people, and, you know, he can only carry four at a time, but he ends up carrying all of them because they, you know, they, they do some big monkeys in a barrel thing. I think I saw somebody 
refer to it like that once. And he does, and he drops him in the water, and I mean, it's like, okay, Iron Man, Iron Man, now it's an Iron Man movie again. Then we see a suit get totally trashed, and it turns out it's not even in the suit. And it's like, come on, guys. Is this is the movie called Iron Man 3, or is it called Tony Stark? I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying. And he's rarely ever in the armor. Um, then they get on the boat, and this is where it gets the big climactic final battle, which I liked it, and I didn't like it. Uh, at this point, Pepper is kidnapped. Uh, very, you know, not, not like I didn't see that coming. Uh, Pepper's kidnapped. Um, she's already been injected with the extremist um, technology, uh, and she's mutating. Um, and then Tony finally summons all of his uh, his armors, the house party protocol, as Jarvis called it. Um, and this is where I start getting pissed because these extremist guys are like just ripping this armor to shreds. You're telling me that, you know, you're telling me that a comparable armor uh, ironmonger couldn't just destroy Tony's suit. You're telling me Whiplash, who could cut things in half with his whips, couldn't just destroy Tony's suit. You're telling me that Thor, the god of thunder, couldn't just rip apart Tony's suit. But some mutated extremists could. So you're telling me the mutated extremists are more powerful than Thor? Is that what you're telling me? Because I don't like that, if that's what you're telling me. Alright, so, <clears throat> moving along. Um... Moving along. In the battle, of course, they find Pepper and Tony and Pepper have this, you know, bit of an exchange. Somehow or another, she's trapped in some debris and the debris is being moved by some kind of conveyor belt. She falls into some fire. Now, honestly, we haven't seen the scene in the movie in the, in that, that was in the previews of her standing in the sports bra in front of the fire yet. So that was, you know, number one, I knew she hadn't died because I hadn't seen that. And number two, she was injected with the extremist technology. So uh, we, we knew she didn't die. You know, and Tony's looking all pissed. Now, a lot of people compl complain that he didn't seem like he cared about Pepper, but what I saw was a man who was pissed. He thought he just lost everything. So I'm going to go ahead and put that complaint to rest. He, no, he, he did care. As a matter of fact, he cared so much that that's what, you know, got him fighting Adrian Killian, which at that point comes a scene that I both love and hate because I love it because it shows Tony constantly having to switch different armors. A lot of people complained about that. I liked it because it got to finally show off all the armors. Because in the comic, he's got armors galore, and we haven't really seen that in the movie. We've seen a couple, but this time we actually see all of them. He's just like, in one armor, out of it. In back in another, out of it. And I like that. Um, what I didn't like about that scene was, once again, it illustrated Adrian Killian just literally like judo-chopping the armors in half. Like, bam, oh, you're in that armor. No, no, you're not in that armor. No, no, you're not in that armor. I got this armor in half. I'm going to cut this armor's leg off. And, you know, it just it got so, like, oh, my God. Did Tony Stark just make a big cave full of junk? I mean, is this not Tony Stark? Is this Tony Stark or isn't it? So, anyway, and then you get to the worst scene in the entire film where Pepper comes out of the fire, expectedly, and, um, after Tony actually uh, sacrifices his suit, he does the coolest thing, I'm thinking, this should have been it. He, he summons the suit onto Adrian and then tells Jarvis to blow the suit up. And I'm thinking, well, that should be it. But no, Adrian comes back from that. Even so, so for some reason, he's the most powerful extremist because he killed others with less. Um, and then Pepper comes out and they have this big fight and she eventually kills him. And honestly, that scene wanted to be badass so bad. It really did. But it came off as campy, cheesy, and cheap. Honestly, I just thought it looked stupid seeing Pepper there. But okay, Pepper's got superpowers now. It's great. Um, that's whatever. And she saves Tony. And then, you know, to impress her, he does the clean sweep protocol, destroys all of his armors. I'm fine with that. Tony can build more armors. But then the epilogue, where we hear Tony's voiceover again. He says that he fixed Pepper. Okay, so you gave her powers and you took them away? All right. Um... And then he fixed himself. He goes under the knife and has shrapnel taken out of his heart so he doesn't need the uh, arc reactor anymore. And of course later, at the end of that epilogue, throws the arc reactor away. Now I'm thinking, uh, if he could just have it surgically taken out, I mean, surely he had to figure it out, great, but shouldn't he have done that in part two instead of wasted the whole movie looking for a non-toxic metal to power his arc reactor? Couldn't he have just had the damn shrapnel removed and that would have solved the problem? I mean... You know, and, 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 and here's another thing. I mean, the movie wasn't exactly standalone. There were references to the Avengers all over the film. So my thing is, nine plus bombings where an uh, international terrorist is uh, taking credit. Where the hell was S.H.I.E.L.D.? 
You tell me they didn't even at least poke their head into interest? No Nick Fury to say, well, what are you going to do about this, Stark? Or, man, you handled that well. I mean, seriously, where the hell were they? It's not like those guys don't have contracts for multiple films. I mean, come on. Anyway, uh, that was pretty much everything I, I hated about that movie. Um, and, I mean, really, that was the whole movie. I, I told it to you in, like, what? I don't know how many, many minutes we've been doing this. Um, didn't take two hours and 20 minutes to tell you that. <clears throat> and just the lack of ACDC music really just, I don't know. Like I said, I'd be willing to forgive all the flaws. Every flaw in that entire film had the Mandarin been real. That's all I would have wanted. Um, so he's got no armors, he's got no mansion. Now he doesn't even need the uh, arc reactor anymore. I mean, this is how you want to round out the trilogy? This is what you want to set up for Avengers 2? I mean, I don't know. Um, like I said, you disappointed me. I I walked out of Iron Man 1 and 2 riding an adrenaline high. I wanted to tell everyone I saw about that movie. I wanted to get everybody I knew to go watch those movies. Man, I mean, the next day I was still riding that adrenaline high. I walked out of this movie... <sighs> And I really liked it at first. I mean, I, I still had my problems even on the drive home. I still was nitpicking it. But the more I think about this film, the less I like it. And, and the longer I go from seeing it, the more I just want to warn people about this movie. God, don't see it. Look, I read a guy, I read, I read one guy said that he downloaded it off of a pirate torrent. And I am very anti-pirate. I, I am just, you, you're just, you're, you're, you're honestly like the lowest of the low if you pirate movies in my opinion but really I did not give a shit that I heard that he pirated this movie because honestly I'm glad he didn't spend his money on it oh it was just that it was just that bad um so that, that that's my thoughts on Iron Man 3 you're probably seeing a lot of videos very similar to it um I mean, you know, but everything else is on par. I mean, the special effects were great. You know, the soundtrack was great, except for the absence of ACDC. Oh, but meanwhile, this whole movie is set to the backdrop of Christmas, but even that really just takes a back seat as you forget it's even Christmas until you see a string of lights in the background or a Christmas tree set up somewhere. And it's like, why? Why did it have to be Christmas? Why? I don't, I don't get it. Um, it was... And the dialogue kind of made it at the beginning like it was supposed to be important, but then it just suddenly wasn't important at all. Um, I don't know. So um, here, here's my thoughts. I, I would. There's not many movies I wish could be retconned, you know, taken away from canon. This movie I wish could be. Uh, I wish they would scrap it, and I wish Favreau would step back up, and they would. I wish they would just try again. I would be willing to wait another two years for uh, a second chance at this movie than to accept this as part of the canon. I really would. Um, <laughs> just my opinion. Do I want my money back? No. As a movie by itself, it was, I guess it was pretty solid. I mean, it was well written for what it was. I just didn't care for the plot. Uh, and it was well directed. I just didn't care for the direction of the film. The characters, they portray themselves as, you know, they always have. Um, I think that was the biggest thing that kept the movie an Iron Man movie, is that Don Cheadle had finally adapted to War Machine. I mean, he was Rhodes. Uh, you know, Robert Downey Jr. was definitely, he's definitely allowed, uh, <clears throat> he's assimilated himself to the persona of Tony Stark. I mean, hell, you see him in interviews, so it's, it's, it's Tony Stark, even when he's not Tony Stark. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was still very much Pepper Potts, so all that stuff was intact, you know. It, and 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 Favreau handed Shane Black a, a a a perfect kit. Here are the parts. Here are the instructions. Here's the other models that 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 came before it. Just just put it together, and he failed. He failed, but he came so close. It was like it was like it was like you're baking a cake, like a chocolate cake that's mostly done. But right in the center, there's this, this core that didn't quite get finished. That's, and, 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 and because of that unfinished core, it totally ruins it. Honestly, I wouldn't have had Adrian Killian in it at all, had it been me. The Mandarin would have been the leader of the Ten Rings, who would have been coming back for well-established revenge. Honestly, um, I would have killed Happy. They had him in an explosion, and he was in a coma most of the movie, and then he wakes up at the end of the film. I would have killed him. I'm sick of America's inability to accept the fact that people die. Let fictional characters go. Let them go. 
Kill him off. I don't care. Because honestly, if he died, it would have meant more. I think he should have. Um, some people would just say I have an obsession with killing off main characters. Because honestly, I would have killed off Pepper. I would have still gave her superpowers, but I think I would have made it... If you're going to make Adrian... If, if you're going to go as far as... And I would have had Adrian Killian at all. But if you're going to go as far as making Adrian Killian um, so superpowered... You know, how the hell is this brand new extremist going to suddenly fight? I think she should have made, made herself overload, realizing she couldn't beat him, and then blown herself and him up. Uh, of course, thus, you know, making Robert Downey Jr. lose just about everything. That way, he, he would have kept Iron Man, because at that point, that's all he's got. His mansion's gone, you know, Pepper's gone, Iron Man's what he's got. That's how I would have done it, if I was going to have Adrian Killian, but I wouldn't have even done that. Um... I would have just had her have her own armor rescue, but, um, you know, that, that's me. Um, I, I, I await fanboy rage. Leave your comments where they go, and um, let me know what you think. All right. Sladio 1 out.